Matthew Addison. I'm employed by Hortgrove Science. Um, so I represent the apple, pear and stone fruit industry and I just want to present my current research on orchard floor ecology um, and more specifically orchard, orchard soil health. Um, the entire research project is centered around the question of does plant diversity benefit orchard ecosystems um, and that would be inclusive of things such as biological control agents and that raises two additional uh, factors one is which plant species can we uh, put into orchards to increase diversity and the major issue is how do we measure uh, those effects. So we designed a, a project, this goes back to 2015, there were four treatments uh, and we couldn't, we couldn't replicate so we have a, a, a four row, four orchard rows per treatment, they're long rows, uh, plus a control and the control was basically business as usual on the farm and I did it in two areas, Varumbokefeld and Pears. Uh, and Koa felt on newly planted apples. So the, the treatments, uh, one to four, basically we have a work row, the access row. Um, in treatment one it was grass, in treatment two it was also a grass mix. Treatment three we added medics and clover to that mix. Uh, and then treatment four was the grass plus quite an extensive mix. Uh, so four was our really diverse treatment and then in the tree row um, under the trees all of the treatments had compost applied the first treatment had a straw mulch on top of it the second one had wood chip on top of the compost uh, the third one we wanted to diversify plants under the tree as well so we put a medic in uh, the fourth one, our diverse uh, treatment, got medics and some other plant species. And the control, as noted, was not cultivated in the work row. Under the tree row, it got compost and a straw mulch. There is our planting list. I don't think the, f the figures are that important. The treatments are on top one to four. Um, the grass mix that was universal was tall fescue, perennial rye and creeping red fescue um, that was applied to, to all of them. The medics were applied at very low rates. Another notable is the triticale. Everybody got uh, triticale, all the treatments got triticale at 20 kilos per hectare. Uh, and then below that is the tree row under the tree. Um, you can see the mix. We put in medics and subterranean clover in treatment three, uh, and then in treatment four, that plus mustard, nasturtiums, and chicory. We also assess floral species. I'm interested in, in flowering plants in orchards, again, for biological control uh, or to enhance it. So we planted uh, a variety of stuff. Felicia, chamomile, coriander, dill, thyme, oregano, and alyssum. Uh, once you've planted a cover crop, you're always worried about what other species uh, one could be using. So I started uh, a replicated assessment at small scale. They were three meter long in the row. I only planted in, in the work row. Um, and we looked at white mustard pea, lucerne, strawberry clover, crimson clover, teff and ceradella and in fact we in the second season assessed uh, additional, additional species. So the assessments are the problem in terms of what do we measure. Uh, you've got to have something that's applied, applicable and affordable. Uh, so in terms of research you try and cover as much as possible so you can analyze it and see what is a really good indicator. 
So our, our assessments involve, involved soil, soil tests, cover crops. I looked at factors like performance and production and phenology. We looked at nematodes. We looked at fungi and fungal diversity, at soil arthropods, and at litter breakdown. And there are a couple of others uh, that I'll mention. So just in terms of, of the assessments, we ran Solvita, Ward Labs, uh, and then later through Soil Health Solutions at NEM, NEM Lab. We looked at nutrients, bioavailability of those nutrients, carbon analysis, soil respiration, and aggregate stability. Uh, the way we did that, and on the right-hand side of the screen, you can actually see one of the students digging a hole. Uh, we took five points in that 120 meter row, we used the middle row. Uh, we took our soil samples at basically 20 meter intervals. Uh, we pulled those, uh, so I got a result per treatment per annum on those. And we monitored in the work row and then immediately adjacent to it in, under the tree. Cover crops, primary production is a fairly simple. I took a quarter, quarter square meter um, and basically removed all the above ground vegetation, classified it, I sorted it into grasses, planted legumes and then other, and other is basically weeds, dried and weighted. Uh, cover crop height is an interesting one to me. I don't know how applicable it is. Uh, but I had a, a, a white board, as you can see, divided uh, at 100 millimeter intervals. I put it in the row. I went back 10 meters and photographed it. And once you photographed it, you can use image analysis to determine uh, the cover per square, 100 millimeter high square, and you get a percentage cover. Uh, cover crop status, basically we looked, I photographed it monthly using the quarter meter square plus a ruler uh, and general photographs and I'd like to e emphasis uh, or emphasize the practicality and the usefulness of taking photographs. Memory is short. Uh, this thing's been running over four years and it's, I, I photographed at the same point per month, every month, and it's fascinating going back uh, and, and seeing the, uh, and, and seeing those photo, looking at those photographs and seeing the effects. Nematodes uh, were submitted to NEM Lab. We looked at plant parasitic nematode counts on those five points per treatment. Uh, we also did a nematode biodiversity index, which NEM Lab does. Um, which has proved useful. Uh, and then Renus Knutzer at ARC ran a series of trials looking at the cover crop species that we are planting as nematode hosts, uh, specifically for lesion nematode, for Pratilenca species. Through Sporotech at university, we did fungal analysis and bacterial analysis. Uh, again on those fixed points uh, and we generated some, some diversity indices and species richness. Soil arthropods, i.e. insects and mites that are running around on your soil surface and in, in the uh, first horizons. Um, we have concentrated on Calembola. They're very small primitive insects. They're very diverse. They're active in and on top of soil, uh, and they are very much involved in litter breakdown, nutrient recycling, etc. I also believe they form an alternate prey for a lot of our biocontrol agents. Um, so we used a litter trap, I'll explain that later. To go on to the results, basically it's in the same format that I've just uh, presented in terms of the order, soil, cover crops, nematodes, etc. Firstly, soils. That is the output of the uh, Solvita and Hanley, etc. tests. It's very impressive. Uh, it's self-explanatory. 
It's fascinating and it's very complex. Uh, just to summarize very briefly, they have a soil health index. On the left hand graph, we're looking at the Co Bockerfeld results for 2018. Um, on the horizontal axis, you had the control on the left, then treatment one, two, three, and four. The row, the work row is in blue. I've stuck to that format throughout. Uh, the red is the tree. So in that, that, is, that was the year of planting. That was taken about six months after we cultivated and planted. Um, we don't appear to have too many treatment effects there except for treatment two, uh, and that is under the tree. Uh, in terms of the row, we have an increasing uh, soil health index over the treatments. Then the following year, remember these are the same points in the same row, uh, we didn't have any significant increase in our, in our row index. Uh, they're all fairly similar, but we certainly see a treatment effect in, under the trees. And yeah, that raises some questions. If we go on to the percentage of organic carbon uh, put in there, left-hand access goes up to 7%. Again, the treatments from left to right, including the control. Uh, we contribute to some carbon. There were some increases in it. Um, remember that in our tree rows, we're contributing both the mulch in treatments uh, one and two. Uh, in three and four, they've got vegetation growing on them and all of them got compost. So you would expect them to be more or less similar. And in fact, they're not. Aggregate stability for the Soil scientist, that is most probably a very meaningful figure for an entomologist. I still wonder, wonder about aggregate stability, but the, the greater your value, the better your, your soil is in terms of, of structurally. Fairly low in the 2018 season, uh, we, our aggregate stability increased, including in our controls uh, under the tree but not uh, in the row itself. Uh, are there treatment effects there? I'm not sure. Uh, 2020 data will be analyzed uh, and the trends hopefully will become more obvious. Uh, and then soil respiration is quite a broad uh, measure of basically anything that is metabolizing in the, in the soil or respiring. Uh, indicates that the row values either either increased slightly or fell slightly but remained sort of similar but we had very in big increases under the tree uh, and I think that's most probably explained by the addition of compost. The only thing that worries me is in treatment three and four in the 2019 our respiration uh, was lower than, for example, treatment two. Treatment two was a wood chip uh, treatment under the tree. Uh, three and four, remember, had plants, uh, plants on them, medics and clovers. The primary production was taken in the first year after, after planting, and that, in fact, is what it looked like. The pictures of treatment two um, there's a planting list, so that is fescue, perennial rye, and red fescue, plus medix, plus triticale. Um, the bottom graph gives you uh, what we actually harvested off there, so we ended up um, with pretty good primary production to give you the details across all of the Treatments. Left-hand graph indicates the the Warenbockerfeld figures uh, for treatments one to four on the right-hand side in in red uh, are the production for the Kohlbockerfeld. And if you look at the right of that Kohlbockerfeld treatment number four, 
we were sitting at 0.95 kilos per square meter dry mass uh, that I was very happy with and then on the right of that is just the percentage of grass uh, that we had in Karaboka felt in blue, clovers in, in red and then other, i.e. weeds, contributing to that dry mass in green. So in terms of producing a lot of dry mass in our first season, I was very happy with that result. Uh, the floral cover crops are, uh, yeah, they're very interesting. They're somewhat problematic. I did plant them in solid, uh, in solid sort of single species blocks. What you're seeing there in the front, the yellow is, is dill, behind it is chamomile. Um, a lot of things did well. Alyssum was certainly the best performer. Uh, those are still under valuation in terms of what effect they will have on biocontrol agents. Uh, small scale assessments of uh, row or cover crop suitable for the work row. Um, on the left you can see crimson clover growing very happily. Um, on the right is the original the original trial block planted out, different species planted out uh, on three meter plots. Again, single species planting that I don't think is a very good idea in retrospect. Uh, there's the same row four years later. The green blocks are lucerne and we're looking very closely at in fact planting lucerne in orchards and uh, we have done so in some orchards. Uh, and immediately behind the lucerne, you can't see it, the other thing that has survived was strawberry clover. So it's fairly hardy um, and able to survive. Cover crop height, um, I've gone into in terms of how we collected it. It is a useful figure, I think, uh, and it links quite well to dry mass production. If you do want to know, it's the easiest way to do it in image J. Uh, it gives you very accurate figures and you could estimate um, if, if one wanted to. The nematodes um, most probably hold the, 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 the bulk of the detail in terms of, um, in terms of data and complexity at the moment. That's the output of the nematode diversity studies. They're very useful. Uh, the results uh, are self-explanatory. I'll just go into one of them in detail. Um, sorry, I'm missing some, some uh, arrows there. But on the left-hand vertical axis, you've got an enrichment index from 0 to 100. That gives you an, an indication of uh, available resources. And then on the, on the horizontal axis, you go from 0 to 100, and that is soil web structural index. That is the linkages between the various types of nematodes. And you have a number of functional groups. There's some that are free living. There's some that eat fungi. Uh, there's some that attack plants. There's some that attack insects. These are measured. Uh, and the different functional groups uh, are used to estimate the, the, the structural index. Let's just have a look what happened. You end up, uh, this, is, this is not to confuse you, this is just to give you an idea of the complexity. Uh, those are two years worth of the Kohlbocker felt results presented per treatment, both in the row and uh, in, under the trees. It's complex and it's difficult uh, to interpret. Um, I think that the, the take-home message here is we basically in, in 2018 started on the left-hand side of that graph with low structural index um, and some enrichment and there's been this progression to the right-hand side of the graph. That means our enrichment index has in fact come down in a lot of cases and our web structural index has gone up. Uh, that is exactly what we want. Um, 
there are a bunch of reasons for it and it's very interesting seeing the similarities between the under tree portion and the work row uh, I've written some sort of comments on the on the right uh, we've had a weed problem so we have had diversity on under the under the trees uh, have we been using less herbicides tree growth more shading for example uh, there's still the use of fertilizers albeit low uh, weeds the use of herbicides all influences and I think in the final analysis we'll get, we, we will most probably get more clarity on this we also looked at plant parasitic nematodes um, root knot ring spiral dagger etc we haven't had any major blowouts we haven't had any major increases uh, it begs the question is if you do have diverse uh, cover crops does it suppress our pest nematodes uh, that leads on to Rena Smuts's work um, the picture on the right is of two or three of the cover crops used he planted them he tested them in uh, in pots for their susceptibility or their host status towards lesion nematode uh, and the results were very complex uh, there are a number of lesion nematode species uh, penetrans, hipparastri uh, and vulnus were assessed the biggest casualty was Indian buckwheat is a very good host for, for uh, lesion nematodes so one can't recommend it some are moderate not very many uh, and the bulk of the species that we plant are either very very unsuitable hosts or not hosts at all uh, and I think if you've got a diverse cover crop in there we're not monocropping anything uh, you will be okay the fungal diversity we did bacterial counts fungal counts uh, we generated some indices off that the results uh, over two years uh, are interesting but we can't see trends yet uh, again I've stuck to my my original uh, graphs with the row being in blue trees in red treatments one uh, to four on the on the bottom axis you can see a bacterial Shannon index no great shakes but what that does indicate to me is what's happening under your tree is also pretty similar to what's happening in the work row that uh, I did not expect. Um, the scatter plots of the uh, results uh, between row and tree, um, you can see two distinct groupings there. Uh, the row results of the light blue you can see there's a lot of overlap that further confirms uh, that between fungi and bacteria under your tree and in your work row there's a lot of overlap and I think that it, that is significant how affected that is by diversity we can't determine yet the soil arthropods very briefly uh, the little red uh, sort of saucer type things are actually traps with a with a grid both bottom and top uh, you can open them we put litter in there in this case apple leaves or pear leaves um, you bury them level with the ground surface and you leave them in there and you go and draw one a month for a couple of months uh, you extract extract what's in there in a the funnel uh, so it gives you two results one is the rate of litter breakdown and what got in there uh, and what got in there is basically everything that crawls around on the upper surface of the of the soil and uh, shallow shallow sort of uh, uh, levels of of soil uh, that's what the the output looks like the little white things on the left are calembola they're about a millimeter long and underneath you can see a whole lot of weird and wonderful things including pseudoscorpions and all battered mites so we only counted the calembola diversity and we're still busy with that 
But to give you an idea, this is Varenbokerfeld results. Uh, total Kalembola on the left, uh, on a scale 1 to 350, uh, over three months, uh, the different treatments, 1 to 4 and a control, uh, fairly low levels. Uh, then uh, you go into the row, i.e. where the, the access row where the tractor is, uh, more plant diversity, uh, very big differences, much more calembola. Uh, that was counterintuitive to me. I would have expected more under the tree uh, in terms of there's compost, there's mulch, uh, there's things happening in there and it gets irrigated. One of the uh, big debates in cover crops is flowers in orchards during blossom. If you have flowers, top right hand uh, image gives you an idea of the amount of flowers in an uh, unmowed orchard versus uh, the bottom one that was the mowed section um, with no flowers. We assess that and our results were interesting in terms of the top left hand graph is the unmowed, i.e. the one with flowers in it, uh, attracted a lot of bee visitations per blossom. Uh, the bottom left, the mowed, with no flowers in the cover crop, attracted less bees. And just for reference, on the right hand side was an adjacent field that had been planted with, with flowering cover crops, uh, didn't draw bees out of the orchard unduly. In general, cover crop, just to summarize, in general, initial cover crop plantings are very challenging. Establishing a cover crop is not easy, it's site specific, it's tricky, uh, especially in colder areas. Uh, cultivation and weeds created some major issues for us. Minimum till plantings on existing cover crops was attempted. Uh, we planted through those, those grass uh, plantings in the work row. It was semi-successful. I think more work could be done there. Indigenous plant species have to be looked at. We're planting exotics. Uh, the indigenous grasses, they're very good at getting carbon into soils. They're hardy uh, and they produce lots of biomass. And litter layer and mulch uh, is important and in fact this coming season, hopefully I'll have a, a mulch project running. In conclusion, uh, I think one of the, the take-homes is take photographs of your cover crops at regular intervals. Uh, they're easy to file and they make for very, very interesting analysis. This is just differences between uh, the power of, of uh, photographs. That's on the left uh, Koa felt that's after cultivation um, in May, in August it looked like that, in September uh, it looked like that and by October it looked like that. Um, you tend to, tend to forget uh, that is the following season, it's a very dynamic, uh, a, a very dynamic system. In